So welcome everybody to our Snow King Water Watchers Monitor Meeting. And I'm really happy to have you all as part of our program. What we're gonna be talking about this evening is we're gonna go over some highlights of this year's monitoring and training activities. We're gonna spotlight a particular program, monitoring program, the Lost Urban Streams program and Unleash the Brilliance with uh, Anna and Hannah. We're gonna share some program updates and possible new training for next year, including a couple areas that I'd like to add into the types of monitoring that we do. Uh, talk about some goals for you and monitoring for this coming year and have a question and answer period. And as we go through, if anybody has a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question. So just kind of covering some of the highlights of uh, what we did this year. Uh, we just recently completed some training for a new group of monitors, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We worked with a variety of partner groups, and we're going to feature some of the different partner groups that we've worked with throughout the year, talk about who they are and what they're doing, um, talk about you and your work, which is really a highlight of what's happened this year despite COVID and everything else, talk about some things that we did in terms of biomonitoring and BIBI assessment, what those mean. So just talking about our new monitoring training, we just recently did uh, completed a course with a cohort of about 20 to 25 monitors. Uh, some of them took all the training um, and some just selected training. And this was water chemistry, physical and chemical, bacteriological monitoring and biomonitoring. And so if you're one of those who just participated in that new training, uh, I'm still working on getting you guys your certificates from the training and getting you set up on sites if you don't already have your sites. So if you haven't already got your site set up um, and I haven't contacted you, feel free to get in touch with me and we'll communicate and figure out where you need to be and how to get you equipped. Just to talk about some of the programs, um, we had Brian McGraw on here and he's with the Edmonds College Green Team. And we've been working with them for several years uh, with Edmonds College, and they monitor in the Muckleteo area and in the, I think Perrindale Creek is in the Edmonds or Linwood area. Um, they've been monitored Japanese Gulch and Big Gulch historically, and they've just recently started to add Perrindale Creek. And this is a program that both does water monitoring and it also provides a service learning opportunity for students at the college. And Brian McGraw is their recent uh, AmeriCorps intern who went through our program training, and he's going to be coordinating the program. We've also been working with the Duwamish Ridge to River project. And so this is a project of the Duwamish tribe, uh, and it's a project to build a trail that's going to connect um, locations in the community um, some tribal locations that are significant, and uh, the Duwamish River. And so they've been monitoring some tributary streams. There's a water quality component to this project, and they've been monitoring some tributary streams to the Duwamish. And we actually found some interesting results when we were out doing training with them. We found that the uh, alkalinity and hardness were a lot higher in these streams than we typically find in other watersheds. And we don't know for sure, but uh, one historic factor in that watershed is that there was uh, concrete kiln dust, a product, of, a byproduct of making concrete that was landfilled throughout the area. So that could be contributing. So that project is happening down in Duwamish area. We're also working with a partner organization called Nature Vision, which is an environmental education organization. And they do environmental education with youth in schools. And so one of the things that they do is they use the water monitoring techniques that we teach to teach water quality and just kind of scientific principles and processes to students. So this is a picture of us going through a recertification with some educators at Nature Vision this year. Another partner group that we worked with was Whale Scout. So Whale Scout is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to benefiting orcas. And the way that they do that is they restore local streams and watersheds. Uh, <clears throat> they mostly do various volunteer projects. And so one of their projects is on Bear Creek in Redmond. And they have a group of interns who work throughout the summer uh, doing restoration work on Bear Creek. 
And as part of their internship for the last couple of years, we've worked with the Whale Scout interns and taught them water monitoring techniques. And this is a picture of this year's cohort of interns doing biomonitoring, stream biomonitoring on Bear Creek, where they're looking at the, uh, the insects that were in the stream, which we found uh, good quality at that location on Bear Creek. Another partner that we worked with this year was the city of Kirkland. And so they organized a cohort of volunteers. They helped recruit. And so there's a number of different locations throughout Kirkland that we've got new monitors uh, monitoring. Uh, another group is the Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association. And they have a group called, and I'm going to totally butcher this word, but Ciudadores del Agua, um, which means caretakers of water. And so that's a team of youth and adults that are monitoring stormwater in South Park in Georgetown. So we did some training with them as well. Another project that we've been working with is the Lost Urban Streams project with Puget Soundkeeper and Unleash the Brilliance. And this program works with youth and they, they monitor and highlight um, lost urban streams or neglected streams. So what I'm going to do is I am going, going to switch over and share Anna's slides and let Anna talk a little bit about the program. Cool. Um, are you switching to a different, uh, the different slides that I sent you? Yeah, it's those two. I have them up too, if you just want, let me share. Yeah, you know what? I think, let me try one more thing and it doesn't work. Technology. Yeah, for some reason, then uh, there, can you see it now? Uh, yep, there it is. Great, awesome. Uh, well, I'm, it's both actually myself and Hannah that are gonna talk to us. We just have like two or three slides to show you. Um, the Lost Urban Creeks Project is a project of Puget Soundkeeper Alliance in partnership with Unleash the Brilliance. And uh, some of you may know Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. We've been around since 1984, and we are a, basically a clean water organization for Puget Sound. We do a lot of uh, beach cleanups, and we also do litigation. We take polluters to court. Um, and we're, we have some advocacy and some um, legislative work that we do, but we have a lot of education activities and we've, we we um, partnered with Unleash the Brilliance and a few other organizations like Porterra and Snow King Watershed Council uh, back in, I think we started in 2017 with this project. Um, and it's basically, we recognizing that Puget Sound's uh, water quality is highly impacted by urban waterways and a lot of these urban waterways are, ha have been neglected. Uh, we uh, created this project uh, with these partners called the Lost Urban Creeks Project. And we chose as our kind of flagship creek, uh, the Springbrook Creek watershed, which is uh, flowing through the cities uh, um, and areas, municipalities of Kent and Renton in South King County. Um, if you're heading down south on I-5 and you uh, get close to SeaTac and you look to your left as you're going south, that, that valley, that deep valley that's filled with big box warehouses and streets and um, industry, that is where the basin of the Springbrook Creek lies. And I would like to put up a map and let Hannah talk to you about our monitoring. Can you shift to the next slide there? Eric and how to take over for a moment. Thank you, Anna. Um, so we have monitored eight different sites over the last two years, which includes three different creeks um, um, in the watershed, including Panther Creek, Mill Creek, and Springbrook Creek. Cool. And I think um, these these not these different colored. Uh, Image, um, numbers are showing our kind of key sites and the and the the different creeks that we're doing. This is Mill Creek in Kent, by the way. There's another Mill Creek in Auburn, but we're we're doing the Mill Creek that's in Kent. And can you go to the last slide there, Eric? And Hannah, could you tell tell them a little bit about our data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
The main thing that we are seeing is that the water quality declines as the river flows downstream into the Kent and Renton Valley, um, because we've seen the lowest of lowest dissolved oxygen rates and the highest turbidity rates in the sample locations that are lowest in the watershed. Yeah, as you can see, our site codes are basically named for the creek location and the river miles from the mouth of the river. And all those starred uh, locations uh, pan on Panther Creek, Springbrook and Mill Creek, the lowest stations are always the one that are in the most trouble. Um, and we have been um, sampling for two years now. This is just data from the last year. Um, and we have, um, you know, we're seeing basically what you would see in a very urbanized uh, environment where the creek has very little, little room to move. It's been channelized. It's got a very, very narrow riparian and it's got a lot of stormwater inputs from the streets and these big massive parking lots that are in the Renton Kent Valley. So this is the kind of things that we're seeing, uh, we've been seeing over the last two years. Um, I wanna just to end by saying we have some plans for the coming year. We're gonna switch to quarterly sampling in Springbrook Creek. And then we're gonna kind of take our, our show on the road and have the youth from Unleash the Brilliance um, visit some other creeks in the area. And I actually wanted to uh, ask the community here if there are some creeks that um, you consider a lost urban creek that we may not know about, um, you can certainly recommend them. We're also looking to visit other creeks where there's other community groups working on those creeks. So for example, this coming Sunday, our November monitoring is actually going to be taking place in Longfellow Creek. And we have um, folk, uh, somebody from the Del Ridge Neighborhood um, Development Association who's gonna show us some of their restoration sites. Um, and so we're gonna be looking to, to visit some other urban uh, watersheds throughout the coming year on, on kind of like a twice a year basis. We'll do different creeks throughout the Puget Sound watershed, mostly in South King County area. We define a lost, uh, the, Chrissy asked, how do we define a lost creek? Uh, for us, a lost creek is a creek that's just neglected. Um, it may flow through, in our case, it flows through kind of, kind of some of them low-income communities, ethnically diverse communities, but also just commercial and industrial areas. Um, so you see a lot of activity around Longfellow Creek. There's a lot of organizations that are working, and the same is true of for Thornton Creek. But I believe as far as I know, we're the only community-based organization doing Springbrook Creek. And yet Springbrook, uh, Springbrook Creek just really didn't have any community proponents. So we're looking for creeks primarily like that, just creeks that have been kind of ignored. They're, they're shunted off to behind the warehouse and uh, they're behind the chain link fence um, and they're just kind of been neglected. Hey, Anna, can you just briefly talk about the magical headwaters of Springbrook Creek? Yeah, um, the very head of Springbrook Creek itself is actually, um, the, it's in Renton and it's, it serves as the water supply or part of the water supply for the city of Renton. It's a spring fed creek. And historically that was um, a major source of water for Renton and, um, and it runs, yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an amazingly good quality creek at, the, at its headwaters, but it deteriorates pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and it, it emerges from the ground as a fairly substantial creek, as I understand. Yes, it, it, it does. Um, we, we're not necessarily tied to creeks that run year round. Um, it's just creeks that are, might be contributing pollution to Puget Sound. We, we did some sampling at Barnes Creek this summer, or we tried to um, in Des Moines, but it had dried up and we had to go further downstream to, to find any water on that creek. Um, so yeah, that's where we're not tied to, I mean, it's preferable that our creeks have water year round. What type, we've been pursuing, the question was, uh, what type of legal cases have we had? We've been pursuing a number of legal cases uh, throughout the lower Duwamish River, um, 
different cases. We, we pursued a case in, in Bremerton against the Navy um, several years back. Um, we, we have essentially never lost a case in the, all the years that we've been working. We've, kept, we've got cases down in Commencement Bay um, all throughout King County and in different areas. And we, we coordinate also with the group, the North Sound Baykeeper in Bellingham and the Deschutes Estuary Restoration Team down in Olympia. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, I should say about um, legal cases is that I'm actually gonna be out sampling on Monday in front of Ashgrove Cement to, to take samples uh, for a, one of our legal cases. And actually Puget Soundkeeper was involved in a very huge, almost landmark legal case uh, with Burlington Northern Railroad uh, relating to the bank armoring all along the shores of Puget Sound, which resulted in a very large legal settlement that uh, now uh, is a substantial portion of funding for the Rose Foundation um, yeah. grants program. Yeah, it, it's been a it's been a hallmark of the Waterkeeper movement as a whole. I mean, Puget Soundkeeper is a part is a member of a much larger network of advocacy groups called the Waterkeeper Alliance. And there are over 350 waterkeepers around the globe that are part of this network. And a large percentage of them have legal programs and they pursue um, legal cases under the Clean Water Act, which has a citizen suit provision. So that you, I mean, it's, it's really unique in the, around the globe that you know we actually have the right as citizens to sue for water quality impacts. And we, uh, can get awards when we win a case. And the way Puget Soundkeeper works is we take that award and we feed it into the Rose Foundation so that that money, we don't benefit directly from that money. It goes back and gets plowed back into restoration and conservation projects throughout the Puget Sound area through the Rose Foundation. Yeah, in fact, one of the our founding grants to get our water monitoring program going came from the Rose Foundation grassroots grants program. So there you go, full circle. All right, well, thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, also. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, so those are some of the different partners that we're working with. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of our highlights this year is our monitors who are at work. So some of you may have read about uh, these monitors. This is Bob Lieber and Kathy Lieber who work with uh, Friends of Saltwater State Park and they monitor at Saltwater State Park, which is down in Des Moines. Um, and this year we did some training with them and did some bio monitoring on that. And they produce a display of their data and put it up in an information kiosk at the park so people can learn about the water quality issues with the park. And here's a couple of our monitors, all appropriately masked up, who are in our meeting this evening on their, their monitoring site on Swamp Creek. So they've been doing that regular monitoring as well. We did a little bit of stream biomonitoring this year, not a ton, but we did a few different sites. And this, for those of you who don't know, this is a method of assessing water quality using uh, essentially stream insects primarily, uh, but macroinvertebrates that live in the bottom of the stream. And you can, they're good indicators of water quality. So typically we wanna try and do this annually for our stream sites. And this is a picture of uh, folks doing some training on stream biomonitoring. This year we just did a, a, we did not do all our sites. We just did a handful of sites this year, but that would be, that would be a goal for next year to get more of that done. I also did a very little bit of BIBI. Um, this is something Lake Forest Park Stream Keepers has done a long, for a long time. The acronym stands for Benthic Index of Biotic Integrity. And it's a little bit more of a, a quantitative uh, method where you, use a particular piece of equipment to disturb the bottom to a prescribed depth and a prescribed time. And then you collect your sample, send it off to a lab. Um, so it's a little bit, it's more quantitative, it's, um, but it's also lethal for the organisms that you use. And so we're not necessarily gonna do this every year, but we'd like to do this, at least get a representative number for each of our different streams at least once. 
Um, this is just a, something that incidentally happened to find in the creek that I monitor when I was out doing the BIBI sampling and it's, a, it's called a freshwater mussel. These are pretty remarkable creatures that are great indicators of water quality. So if you find a lot of these, it indicates good water quality and they, they're filter feeders. So they filter the water. They're very long lived. And uh, if you're lucky, you may find one of these when you're out monitoring. All right, some program updates. So we're still doing training as a combination of Zoom and in-person, and that seems to be working well. So we're probably gonna continue with that model of training. Uh, we recently added about 20 new monitors, as I mentioned in our, our training in October. And we're looking to add a couple of different types of uh, monitoring to what we do. And a piece of good news, we uh, recently received news that we have got funding for at least two more years uh, for our program. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a DNA sampling project. So a stream flow assessment is something which essentially you're, you're measuring the, it's the cubic feet per minute of flowing in the creek. And it's something that varies seasonally, it varies with storms. It's just an interesting indicator. And there's different ways that you can do it. Um, but essentially you measure, you calculate a cross-sectional area of the stream and then how long it takes something to float downstream to give you an idea of the, the velocity. And that you can use that calculation to um, determine the flow. So that's just a, a useful reference just to add to our baseline information about the creeks that we're monitoring. And I see Anna has a raised hand, Anna. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, after we released our first report on our water quality in our first year of doing it, uh, the first comment I got from a local stakeholder, like uh, it was like a King County person, was, you know, you need to include some information on your stream flow. And our uh, Global Water Watch data sheet, basically it just asks us, is, it, is the water flowing fast or slow? or intermediate, or I think stagnant is not another option. But I wanted just to point out that a lot of the creeks uh, around here do have um, USGS flow stations. And you can look up the data uh, for these creeks that have them, um, sorry. And so that's another potential resource that you can, can utilize for getting information on stream flow. Good, good information. Thank you. Uh, another thing that uh, we've done to a little degree when we do our biomonitoring, but not as systematically as we could, is a more of a detailed habitat assessment. And so this would be something where you're looking at um, a more detailed analysis of what is the character of the bottom? Is it primarily cobble, sand? You know, what percentage? Um, is there large woody debris? Um, how, what's the sinuosity? Like how, how much does the stream go back and forth versus straight line? There's a whole host of things. Um, there's a group that we've, uh, there's a local group, the Pierce Conservation District Stream Team is kind of the oldest and sort of model organization for community-based water monitoring in the area. And they have, uh, some great habitat assessment tools and training. So I think we're going to try to uh, piggyback on what they're doing and, cap and capture some more information about our streams. This is something like, for instance, on the stream where I, that I live on, Little Swamp Creek, I've noticed changes over the years of the, the channel, the character of the, the stream channel, um, but I haven't formally been able to document those where if this was something that we did in a more formalized manner, you could say, okay, well, it was, it had this kind of a bank character, this kind of a bottom character at this year, next year, we found that it was different in these ways. So that's something I think would be valuable data for us to capture. Another project that I'm going to be working on with uh, Gary Olson with Thorn Creek Alliance is a DNA assessment of the bacteria that are found in streams. And so the, the technique that we use currently, this Coliscan Easy Gel, you know, we 
we capture a sample, we incubate it. And then if you have the dark blue colonies, then those are E. coli. And if you have pink or red, those are other coliform. But they don't really say for sure exactly what it came from. And so Gary learned about a technique uh, that this particular scientist and company that he started is using where you can get a very detailed profile of all the, the whole microbiome of that water. So all the bacteria that lives in there, what is it, where is it from to a very detailed level? Like, you know, if it's a human source, sometimes you can find out, is it a human or not? In this case, you could say it's a human source from a leaking side sewer. It's a human source from a failed septic system. It's a human source from an encampment, et cetera. So you get very detailed with this. So we just recently learned that as part of our, uh, continued grant funding, we've got some funding to do this work. So we're gonna be getting started on this project pretty soon as well. So some goals for monitors this coming year would be, I would uh, set a goal is to try to continue monthly monitoring for chemistry and bacteria on the sites that you monitor. Try to do biomonitoring, I would say, probably once in the summer or fall for your site. So we can get a characteristic of that. Add some flow monitoring. So we start to capture some of that data in the habitat assessment. Um, I would say if we've never done BIBI for your site that we'll try to do BIBI one time for your site. Uh, do what you can to learn more besides just the data that you're capturing yourself with your monitoring, but try to learn about what's happening in your watershed. What are the things that are influencing it so that you can tell people, you know, hey, I'm, I'm learning that the water quality here could be better because of X, Y, Z. So you can really explain what you're doing to people and what's happening to your watershed. And then um, we have a recertification process. Uh, so the, the normal process that we do for training and recertification is after your first year, you go through a recertification process. And what that consists of is you take a written test and then it essentially just says that you are still familiar with the water monitoring concepts. And then you uh, sit down with a one of our trainers who just wa watches you go through your uh, monitoring protocols and confirms that you're doing them correctly. So it's after the first year for new, new monitors and every two years after that. That's part of the Global Water Watch pl uh, plan. And normally they'll prompt you if you have not recertified. They have made some changes to that. Uh, essentially, they were for this past year, they were basically waiving the recertification requirement because of the, the complicated logistics of getting people together with COVID. But we're trying to get back on our kind of our regular track. Uh, so that, yeah, the written forms, the quiz, and the practical checkoff. So that's kind of our process. So now I'm gonna open it up and just see if you guys have any questions on what we can do to support you. Um, and I also just wanna say thank you to all of our partner organizations, uh, all of you for monitoring, um, in particular, King County Council Member Rod Dombowski and King County Waterworks Grant Program that have funded us for the next couple of years. Um, we have the partner Cascade Water Alliance and Global Water Watch. So with that, I'm gonna stop the presentation and just open it up and ask, see if anybody has any questions. Eric, you, this is Eric. <clears throat> yeah. Eric. Um, you were doing some investigation about trying to figure out how to measure the nitrites and nitrates. Did we ever get anything going on that? Yeah, that's a good question. So what, We've so nit nitrates, nitrates and phosphates are nutrients, and that's another variable that's of interest to us as water monitors. Um, there's, uh, I so far haven't found the ideal testing methodology. So when I look at what Pierce Conservation District uses, they use a Lamont nitrate kit, and the the range of sensitivity on it is like like one to five parts per million and i think that the the level of concern is is a lot lower than that so i was looking for something more specific so we have a, a piece of equipment called a photometer so we can collect a sample 
and um, put it into this piece of equipment to get a more detailed nitrate result. Um, so we have a way to capture it, but logistically, we just have this one piece of equipment and getting it for all the sites. Uh, I'm still working on what would be the best way to make that available to our monitors. So I guess it's kind of a long way of saying I haven't got the perfect nitrate test yet. Um, so yeah, so Eric, uh, also the, you know, we do the same, obviously the same photometer testing um, for stormwater analysis and the problem that we've seen is that nitrate is, is um, by this photometric method is not very good at, even though we're into the part per uh, billion levels is what the manufacturer would state. Um, we've done a number of samples. And in fact, Eric came over and we kind of did some duplicate sampling <laughs> one, you know, versus uh, some known samples. And you have to get actually a little bit higher than what the manufacturer uh, of the equipment and the reagents um, is indicating is the sensitivity of this. So it's a go around thing. Hopefully maybe we'll resolve it, but the manufacturer did say that nitrate is very difficult to get at these particular levels. And he thought maybe it was the reagent that was the problem or the, you know, the, which, the chemicals that we use for the test, but um, we're still looking at that. Phosphate is another story. That's pretty reliable and we can get some pretty good numbers on that. All right, thanks, Gary. Uh, I see Anna has her hand up, if, unless that's still up from before. Yeah, I just wanted to know if you have um, uh, planned any future trainings yet or know when you might be doing it. You mean just kind of a regular series of classes? Yeah, yeah, when you might do another round. Um, probably, probably the next regular series of classes will be in March, just kind of as a general group training. Um, but, you know, for specific groups or more specific training, we may do, we may schedule some specific ones sooner. Cool. Um, Mark has his hand up, Mark Phillips. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Eric, that DNA sampling that you talked about sounds really, uh, really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I suppose it has costs with it above the easy, beyond the easy gel method that we use now for, for, for basic screening. So maybe it would be, I'm assuming that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it'd probably be something you would not do every time. It might be good to, to help uh, pinpoint sources or get a sense of sources at one time and then do it periodically after that, maybe. Yeah, so Gary, might. Gary and I are working on that right now, but essentially what we're gonna try and do initially is we're gonna collect some samples and then <clears throat> at, we're gonna, have those held while we run a easy gel test also on that water sample so that we have kind of a known high bacteria situation. Then we're gonna do the DNA testing on that water where we have that known high bacteria situation. And I think right now we're just kind of going through it for sort of a proof of concept and to see what we learn from it to prove that it can be done by community groups and that the information we get from it is useful, but ultimately it could be very useful because it could be something where you could, you could really, if you have a watershed that has a particularly bad bacteria problem, you could help. Would, would, and a follow-up question, would the results of that give you basically an inventory of the uh, creatures that live in the water? I mean, I've heard of DNA testing that could be used just on water samples that would give you an idea of, of um, yeah, you know, the fish, fish as well as mammals and birds, but um, I, you know, from my experience with coliform bacteria, it's uh, it's related to mammals more and and and, and birds. But uh, I wonder what how wide a, a biological diverse uh, inventory would it give you? So I I can answer that a little bit for you. So the um, this particular technique uh, uses. Uh, what they call a phylo chip. And basically what that does is simultaneously look at um, different um, bacteria materials that are in the sample. And the, uh, the company Veriset, which uh, came out of uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, one of their professors there, um, then 
has run through samples from dogs, cats, cows, bones, so on and so forth. So he has a long list of a, li a library of things to match up against these signals that he gets from the phylo chip. So he's able to, yeah, in one sample, identify what is in the water sample um, to give us an idea of the source, whether it's human or coming from dogs that are walking by the creek or cows that are by the creek in, in the more rural settings. So that's very valuable. Um, and from a cost perspective, and you know, what we're looking at is about $400 plus, plus some sampling stuff to do um, one sample. Um, but if you talk, if you look at what would have to be spent in order to get that kind of information from other sources like King County uh, Environmental Lab and who, do, who only does a few things, but also other labs, it would be literally in the thousand dollar plus arena. So this really gives us an opportunity to get a lot of information at um, not $3 or $4 a sample, but you know, something a lot more reasonable that we can you know, pull that information together. Thanks, Gary. I see uh, Debbie has her hand raised. Uh, yeah, actually, I just had a few on that. Um, I was just curious with all, I mean, the, the homeless encampments along the creeks is, is probably like all over our region. We have an especially severe problem with it right here at the Cedar, it's right downtown and there's homeless camps galore. And I was just curious if there's been any maybe additional funding or any kind of more incentive to say, whoa, okay, if we can do our testing here where we know that there's really big established homeless campments, not to be picking on homeless people, but I just mean if we're constantly getting bacterial samples around areas that we know have high concentrations of homeless, you know, is it possible to move them or whatnot? It's like this huge societal problem. It's not just to our creeks, but I didn't know if there has been, you know, in the DNA testing that we've done, have there been correlations um, with our Snow King with places? Like I remember when I was up at Matthews Beach, you know, we, we were having all of a sudden a lot of homeless encampments there and we were getting higher E. coli. Have we had ones that have shown a correlation? I don't know that we can say anything definitively about any kind of correlation like that. Um, we certainly have some sites with high levels and some sites with low levels, and there could be a variety of sources. I guess the one sort of a, a potential byproduct of this DNA process is that it, it might, if, if one of the sites we select happens to show a large hit on that, it could highlight that as an issue. Yeah, okay. so um, on Thornton Creek, we do have encampments and we did do some testing below the encampments and did see higher E. coli levels, which we've reported to Seattle Public Utilities. Um, and this uh, Veriset test, it can distinguish between um, encampment waste, if you will, and waste coming from um, the sanitary sewer, because homes coming, material coming from a house or from business will have a lot of other things associated with it versus something just from a straight encampment situation. So there are ways to look at the information and kind of make some judgments about the sources, as Eric kind of mentioned earlier. And did you get any results we have from the... Yeah, so in terms of doing it, we're on the early stage of this. We have not, okay. our program has not done this. Uh, the city or, or SPU has done some DNA analysis, mm -hmm. but again, it's, it's not done. Um, I don't know if they've done anything around encampments. They do find human you know, signals, but they can't really tell you it's totally that it's a it's a more very quantitative not very or a very qualitative or not very quantitative sure okay yeah same with the dog things people have, yeah. have yeah. dogs exactly. in the right yeah the creek all the time yeah okay and the only other question i had was i take it um for the back to the nit nitrates and nitrites uh, aquarium sampling for nitrate and nitrite that's just too mm -hmm. not not uh, discreet enough the um, that's like way at a totally 
minuscule level or something. It's not, or the opposite end of the spectrum. It's just, it's just saying, oh, you have nitrates, right? It doesn't give parts per million or billion or anything. Question. That, Question. Yeah, there's, I've, I've tried some different testing methods. You know, I tried some strips that were probably des designated or designed for hot tubs. Those weren't really super effective. Oh, yeah. Um, I've tried this photometer, which has its pros and cons. You know, one of the big cons is that all the samples would have to come back to the photometer. So it doesn't really work for a large, a wide variety of sites to use on a regular basis. Um, and I did obtain a Lamotte kit for nitrate and nitrite. And so that may be ultimately the way to go is just to get uh, something more designed for citizen science that can be provided to the different monitors. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I was just curious if there were like spikes and you know when people are using quick release fertilizers and stuff, if you're getting like a spring flush and stuff, but name it. Okay, work in progress. I love it. Yep. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or things people want to share? Well, I'm going to ask a question um, with regard to the E. coli testing. Um, so we have a uh, uh, a supplier that's having trouble getting their supplies, just like a lot of people are these days. I don't know if you guys have experienced it yet um, in Snow King Watershed, whether you have, you know, order a big supply and it lasts you for a year or whether you order up smaller supplies. But one of the things that we've been seeing more recently is um, more teal colored um, e. coli, what we, I'm going to say E. coli related um, colonies. And I'm just wondering in your sampling, are you guys seeing that as well? And again, we tend to have higher E. coli levels on Thornton Creek than perhaps some of your other creeks would have. But I was just curious, you know, you know how old is your, your know, batch that you're using currently? And have you been seeing anything different about that than perhaps previous batches? Yeah, I'll say, and I'll maybe ask Eric Strom to comment on it as well. But from, from what I, from my experience, I would have to say, yes, I feel like I have been seeing more of those, those teal colonies. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, 100%, um, the, the Coloscan easy gel technique that we use for bacteria monitoring uh, causes the colonies to show up as certain colors, and it depends on the, the predominance of certain enzymes in that bacteria. Um, but yeah, I, have, I noticed that I, I recently had some that had a lot of those teal colonies and that were more difficult to count. I felt like definitively what was E. coli and what was not. Right. Eric Strong. Hey. The, the ones that I've gotten have also increased. Um, they're, I haven't had any trouble finding them, but um, yes, very much so. Um, along with the, the regular dark blue and, and black ones, but yes, have seen that. And also the, the the trickle effect of supplies <laughs> I have been, been seeing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's perhaps, uh, you know, I've been trying to reach the manufacturer on this particular issue. And again, that's another thing that's changed here. So I'm a little concerned. I don't know if people know the history, but the original um, inventor of this process who established the company um, basically lost control of the company about a year or so ago. And it was done kind of legally, but unfortunate. And uh, so he's no longer associated with the company. So it's now more in the hands of somebody that's not quite as technically knowledgeable of what's going on. And then you hit it with these supply issues and it starts to be a little bit more of a concern. So I just bring that up. Um, hopefully it'll stabilize, but, um, you know, it's, it's right now, it's a little more worrisome, uh, yeah. trying to do our work and make sure that we're reporting accurate information. So, yeah. And I think I see that Mark Phillips had his hand up. 
Oh, thanks, Eric. I'm just following up. So we're getting ready to, in December, we need to order some more of the bacteria testing kits. Uh, are we going to find a problem? Is it because I haven't experienced a shortage in the past or even a delay, I don't think. How, how, how big a supply do you normally get for how many months or what length? Oh, probably for a, a five, four, five, five or six months, you probably order 90 to 100 at a time. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, so we're, we basically order um, 200 every three months, roughly. Right. So that's kind of our rate of burn. And um, in the last year, we've had two interruptions of that. And the most recent one was just this last week. Um, and we're considered a small order for them. Right. Um, so you would even be smaller, but yeah. they felt that they might be able to give us half of what our order was within a week or so. So we'll oh, see really? if that happens. But my guess is if you're looking to order, get your order in ASAP. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. In other words, tomorrow, call them up and say that you would you need your supply and give them the order. And hopefully, you know, at least it'll be in the queue. You know, and um, I've been in communication with uh, Serge from Global Water Watch. And I don't know how close he is to finalizing it. He was actually looking at a alternative technique, um, which is more of like a card. You'd put your sample on this card and the colonies would grow and you could count on it. Right. Used less material, um, you know, less wasteful. And right. yeah. you know, so I don't know if he, if they've got that up to, you know, ready for distribution yet or not, but uh, that's another area to look into. Right. Uh, can I ask another question about those teal colonies you were talking about? I, I guess I just haven't been sensitive to that. I'll watch for them in the future, but I, I I've probably been counting them as uh, E. coli. How, when you see them in your plates, how do you count them? You, you, I'm sure you don't ignore them. Well, I can tell you how we count them and Eric can say how they do it. So basically, if you take a look at what Micrology puts out, they put out a color chart of the various colonies and the colors and how you would interpret it. And it turns out that teal finds its way into both columns, okay? So what we tend to do is um, we, you know, we take a picture of our plates and then we uh, magnify it and we look to see if we can see a darker center that tends to look towards bluish. And that's what we tend to count on it. But if it's totally kind of teal without, you know, you know, that kind of a look, then we historically have not counted it. But as I said, now it's gotten worse from our perspective. So it's even more difficult to say that it's, if it's teal, it isn't E. coli. That's why it's a little confusing at this point. But Eric, I don't know how you guys are handling it. We just use that. I mean, that's a kind of a, a sort of a gray area, but we, we, we defer back to that color guide from, from uh, micrology and just try to use that. Um, but it does make it confusing because it's, you know, we teach everybody it's either dark blue, kind of dark blue to purple or right. it's pink. And then you get these teal and these other oddball colors and they're like white or gray. And it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how do you deal with those? But so far we're still trying to rely on the more dark blue to dark purple at, um, you know, or teal with a dark blue center. Right. If you can pick out blue, that usually makes you feel a little more comfortable about calling it E. coli. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, I had a, uh, let's see, I had a uh, slide a few slides back. This one. And this actually was a pretty recent one. So I don't know if you guys can see that. So that's kind of, so we had a handful of those teal ones in there as well, but, but also a lot of obviously dark blue. So we're counting the dark blue 
we're not counting the light teal um, and we're not counting the pink. Right. And in this particular case, the levels are so high that you, it doesn't make a big difference. What we're having trouble with is when we get 10 or 12 or 13 and they're kind of more teal. And, you know, they're not the, what we've been seeing in the past, which is uh, further blue. So, you know, there's something going on, but, you know, we'll have to come get to this figured out. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to wrap us up here pretty quick. I see one more hand up with Debbie right now. Just with that, I was kind of curious because I always get the updates from King County when they do the beach closures in the summer. And I was mm -hmm. curious, do they do, they're always testing the bacteria. Do they use a similar COLA scan? And I'd be so curious to kind of compare our results sometimes with the county. They test weekly at all, at, you know, the local beaches. So what's, you know, how do they deal with this problem? And do they use the same bacterial testing or, or do we know how they test or? So just to answer your question specifically, they do not use the same technique. They take a water sample and they send it to a lab. That doesn't ah, sounds expensive. <laughs> wow. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, Jim, Jim Freeze has his hand up. Different subject, and I won't go very deep into it. But if anybody has any background or knowledge of this, uh, maybe Eric could give me your contact information. Um, I'm going to use my data. Um, Jim Matilla, some people know him, fishery biologist, uh, suggested a description. Crystal Creek flows through a 3.1 acre lake with seven and a half million gallons of water in it. The water's coming in uh, at tolerable temperatures from two streams. It exits that lake at 77 degrees Fahrenheit during the warmest month. So everything downstream from the lake is uh, too warm and too low in oxygen. Playing with the idea, uh, doing the preliminary research to apply for a grant to inject 54 degree well water into the lake. Does anybody know of a stream that's been, uh, like an urban stream that's been rehabbed with groundwater? Hmm. Good question. You know, I could look into it, Jim. It there was a proposal for the uh, for the Sammamish River a few years back that was before the Raya Eight Salmon Recovery Council, really? and I believe I believe that one of the pieces on that was to try to introduce uh, cooler water into the river, and I just don't know if that actually happened or not. And it would have been by well digging some wells, I guess, in the in the stream bed, um, and I just don't know if that actually happened or not. Um, but I can I can I can ask a few questions and get back to you. Yeah, we'll we'll chat about it. Um, thanks, Mark. All right, Mark. thanks. I see Jacob has his hand up. I have just a super basic question about that. Uh, doesn't so uh, doesn't groundwater have a lower dissolved like lower amount of dissolved oxygen? So like it would lower the temperature, but what would it do to the dissolved oxygen if that's also a problem? There are aeration systems that you put in line with your pump. Um, uh, Nisqually Trout Farm is a good source for basic information about that. The aerators. Cool, simple answer. You can raise the oxygen level of a lot of water with those things. Awesome. Eric Strong has um, uh, Mark, um, McKinnon Creek comes into Lion Creek at about 47 degrees. Um, but since it's groundwater, or at least yeah. about 80, 85 gallons a minute are, is coming out of the artesian wells in McKinnon. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about what the impact of the dissolved oxygen might be, but that might be a thing to, to check out just, just downstream of Connie and Byron Barn. Yeah, well, we, have to, yeah, we, we don't have anything right in that particular area, but. But you do uh, you do dissolved oxygen testing on McKinnon? Um, I've done I've done several sets of, of testing just to see, you know, what if anything is in it. It's it's awfully pure. Um, but but I can't I can't find you know any way to test for things like calcium or nitrates or that sort of stuff. So I have to 
have to kind of count on the water district for that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, uh, Eric, maybe it would be you know, a simpler thing to just test the water that's cut at, you know, a short distance down from the, 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 the spring for the right. DO content that it has there. Right. Uh, that might be a more direct kind of way to get a sense of what it's doing. Right. Can and I know you water district people are, 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 are very intense in your understanding of the purity of that water. <laughs> Regina? This is Mark Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else have any other last uh, thoughts or questions or anything? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating in our monitor meeting and for all your great questions and things that you wanted to share with us. I really appreciate it and appreciate you being part of this program and part of this water monitoring community. So uh, thanks again, and um, see you guys in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Thanks, Eric. All right. Bye, Mark. Thanks much.